Continuing on, we look at the actual texts that are provided here by Bhikkhu Bodhi in his anthology. So again, this is the path to liberation. And the first section within this chapter is, why does one enter the path? And within that, the first text is called, The Arrow of Birth, Aging, and Death. Thus I have heard, while uh, Malunkaya Putta was alone in meditation, the following thought arose in his mind. These are those ten metaphysical questions that we mentioned previously. The world is eternal, the world is not eternal. The world is finite, the world is infinite. The soul is the same as the body. The soul is one thing and the body another. After death, a Tathagata exists. And after death, a Tathagata does not exist. After death, the Tathagata both exists and does not exist. After death, the Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist. And so he was pondering these things during his meditation. And so he thought, the Blessed One does not declare these to me, and I do not approve of and accept this. So I shall go and ask him. What, the, what is the meaning of this? So in paragraph three, then in the evening, he went to the Blessed One and here, Venerable Sir, while I was alone in meditation, and so he goes back through all of these questions once again, asking them to the Buddha. If the Blessed One knows and repeats it yet again, let the Blessed One declare that to me. Then in number four, paragraph four, uh, how then, did I ever say to you, come, lead the spiritual life under me, and I will declare to you, and then he goes through all of the questions. No, venerable sir, did you, did you ever tell me, I will lead a spiritual life under the Blessed One, and the Blessed One will declare to me, and then he goes through the list again. No, venerable sir, that being so, misguided man, who are you, and what are you abandoning? So then he continues, if anyone should say thus, I will not lead the spiritual life under the Blessed One until the Blessed One declares to me, and it goes back through the list again, that would still remain undeclared by the Tathagata, and meanwhile that person would die. So if you're expecting him to get an answer to each of those questions, forget it, you're gonna die first. Suppose a man were wounded by an arrow, thickly smeared with poison, and his friends and companions, his kinsmen and relatives brought a surgeon to treat him. The man would say, I will not let the surgeon pull out this arrow until I know whether the man who wounded me was a katya, a brahmin, a merchant, or a worker. And he would say, I will not let the surgeon pull out, of the arrow, pull out this arrow until I know the name of the clan, the man who, of the man who won, wounded me, until I know whether the man who wounded me was tall, short, or middleweight until I know whether the man who wounded me was dark brown or golden skinned, until I know whether the man who wounded me lives in such a village, town, or city, until I know whether the bow that wounded me was a longbow or a crossbow, until I know whether, and he goes on and on and on. <laughs> but you begin to get the idea, okay? I'm not gonna let you do this until then. And then all this would still not be known to that man, and meanwhile, he would die. Okay? So too, if anyone should say thus, I will not lead the spiritual life under the Blessed One until the Blessed One declares to me, he goes through the list yet again, that would still remain undeclared by the Tathagata and meanwhile that person would die. If there is the view that the world is eternal, the spiritual life cannot be lived, and if there is the view the world is not eternal, the spiritual life cannot be lived. Whether there is the view the world is eternal or the view the world is not eternal, there is birth, there is aging, there is death, there are sorrow, lamentation, pain, dejection, and despair, the destruction of which I pres prescribe here and now. And so once again, he repeats all of this. Numbers, the paragraph seven there at the bottom. Therefore, remember what I have undeclared as undeclared. Remember what I have declared as declared. So just listen to what I've said. Don't, don't try to figure out what I haven't said. And then in the next page, paragraph eight, why have I left that undeclared? Because it is unbeneficial. 
It does not belong to the fundamentals of the spiritual life. It does not lead to disenchantment, to dispassion, to cessation, to peace, to direct knowledge, to enlightenment, to nirvana. And what have I declared? This is suffering. This is the origin of suffering. This is the cessation of suffering. This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. Why have I declared that? Because it is beneficial. It belongs to the fundamentals of the spiritual life. And so on. Therefore, remember what I have left undeclared as undeclared. And remember what I have declared as declared. So, fairly straightforward. Let go. Leave it alone. You don't need to know that. It's not going to make any difference. Okay? So the, the second one here is the one about the heartwood, and this is a series of stories that are, again, long and detailed, so we're skipping big parts of this, but we're really looking at what is the essential purpose of the spiritual life. Uh, Thus I have heard, and this one is said to have occurred on Vulture Peak, monks, here some clansmen goes forth out of faith from the household life into homelessness. And then he has all of these other pieces of that. And he acquires gain, honor, and renown. He is pleased with this. His intention is fulfilled. He lauds himself and disparages others. He becomes intoxicated with that, grows negligent, and lives in suffering. Suppose a man needing heartwood came to a great tree, cut off its twigs and leaves, thinking they were heartwood. And then it goes on through some things. Whatever it was this good man had to make his heartwood, his purpose will not be served. He can't make furniture out of twigs and leaves. Well, usually. We have a bamboo, or not bamboo, a palm leaf piece of furniture right over here. Uh, whatever it is, good man, that had to make the heartwood, his purpose would not be served. So too it is with his monk, who this monk who becomes intoxicated with that gain, honor, and renown. And then he goes through this again, where he acquires very, this gain, honor, renown. He's not pleased with that. He does not laud himself and disparage others. He does not become intoxicated with that, does not grow negligent with that. So he's doing a better job, or this one's doing a better job here. He achieves attainment of moral discipline. Then he lauds himself, disparages others, becomes intoxicated, grows negligent, lives in suffering. So the top of the next page. Suppose a man needing a heartwood, and he goes through, but this time he gets the outer bark, and thinking it was heartwood. And of course, the same type of thing happens. So in paragraph four, we have another story, very similar, requires gain, honor, renown. He's not pleased with that, but he's diligent and he achieves moral discipline. He's pleased, but his intention is not fulfilled. He does not laud himself and disparage others. He does not become intoxicated. Being diligent, he achieves the attainment of concentration. So in this case, we're going a little bit further. He's pleased, he lauds himself, disparages others, becomes intoxicated, falls into negligence, and lives in suffering once again. So suppose a man needing heartwood, and we go through the same thing, only this time he gets the inner bark. And then thinking that it was heartwood and so forth, so again, he fails to get what he actually needs. In paragraph five, we have the same kind of a process where he acquires gain, honor, and renown. He's not pleased. He does not laud himself and disparage others. He does not become intoxicated. He does not grow negligent. He achieves knowledge and vision. He lauds himself, disparages others, becomes intoxicated, falls into negligence, lives in suffering. Such a life. <laughs> Will we ever get out of this? So then a man needing heartwood cuts off the sapwood, thinking it was heartwood. And we go through the same process all over again. 
Then another one comes along, goes through the whole process, acquires gain, honor, renown, achieves attainment of moral discipline, attainment of concentration, knowledge and vision, does not laud himself and disparage others, does not become intoxicated with that knowledge and vision, does not grow negligent and fall into negligence, attains perpetual emancipation, and is impossible for that monk to fall away from that perpetual liberation. So he's finally attained it. So suppose a man needing heartwood came along cutting off only the heartwood, knowing it was heartwood. His purpose will be served, so too it is with this monk who attains perpetual liberation. So this spiritual life monks is not, uh, does not have gain, honor, and renown for its benefit, or the attainment of moral discipline for its benefit, or the attainment of concentration for its benefit, or knowledge and vision for its benefit. It is this unshakable liberation of mind that is the goal of this spiritual life, its heartwood and its end. So it, it's, it's a very long story. Of course, I left out a lot of what's in here, and he left out a lot of what was in the original. So we skipped over pieces, but I think we, we get the message very easily of what he's trying to articulate as a, a part of this, that we can't get caught up in the bits and pieces and think this is it. We have to go all the way through in order to get the real benefit doesn't mean we can't get some benefit along the way. Uh, people that begin meditation just because they want to help relieve some stress in their lives, they can get some of that benefit. They're not going to get liberation from just that, but they will still get some benefit. Continuing on page 238 then, the third of this set is the fading away of lust, that strong desire of gotta have it. Monks, if wanderers of other sects asked you, for what purpose, friends, is the spiritual life lived under the ascetic Gotama? You should answer him thus, it is for the fading away of lust. Then, if the wanderers of other sects ask you, is there a path, a way for the fading away of lust? Answer them thus, there is a path, a way for the fading away of lust. And what, monks, is that path for the fading away of lust? It is the Noble Eightfold Path. This is the path, the way for the fading away of lust. And then skip that short paragraph, or else you may answer them, it is for the abandoning of the fetters, for the uprooting of the underlying tendencies, full understanding of the course of samsara, for the destruction of the taints, for the realization of the fruit of true knowledge and liberation, for the sake of knowledge and vision, for the sake of final nirvana without clinging. If the wanderers of other sects ask you, is there a path for attaining final liberation without clinging? Answer them thus, there is a path for attaining final nirvana without clinging. It is the Noble Eightfold Path. So that doesn't really tell us a whole lot new, but it does make very clear this is for dealing with this kinds of cravings that we have in our life that create other kinds of problems for us. On the next page, then, we go into analysis of the Eightfold Path, a little bit more detail about the actual path rather than just general statements about it. Monks, I will teach you the Noble Eightfold Path, and I will analyze it for you. Listen and attend closely. What is the Noble Eightfold Path? And then he goes through and actually lists the eight parts. Then, what is right view? Knowledge of suffering, the origin of suffering, the cessation of suffering, the way leading to the cessation of suffering. And what is right intention? Intention of renunciation, non-ill will, harmlessness. And what is right speech? Abstention from false speech, abstinence from malicious speech, abstinence of harsh speech and idle chatter. And what is right action? Abstinence from destruction of life, taking what is not given, sexual misconduct. And what is right livelihood? Having abandoned a wrong mode of livelihood. He doesn't give the specifics of that, but there are some specific things that are mentioned, things like being a butcher or dealing in arms, things we've already looked at before. 
Then number six is right effort. A monk generates desire for the non-arising of unarisen, evil, unwholesome states. And then he talks about the abandoning of arisen, evil, unwholesome states, desire for arising of unarisen, wholesome states, desire for continuation of arisen, wholesome states, their non-decline, increase, expansion, and fulfillment of development. He makes an effort, arouses energy, applies his mind, and strive. So this is kind of like saying where it is unborn may it arise, where it is born may it not decline, but ever increase higher and higher. Uh, looking at the, the good things that you want to, if it's there, you want it to stay there or even get better. If it's not there, then you want to develop it so that it does get there. Number seven, right mindfulness. Here a monk dwells contemplating the body in the body. Having removed longing and dejection in regard to the world, so a sense of equanimity, he dwells contemplating feelings in feelings. Having removed longing and dejection, he dwells contemplating mind in mind. Having removed longing and dejection, he dwells contemplating phenomena in phenomena. Having removed longing and dejection in regard to the world. And then the number eight, right concentration. Secluded from sensual desires, from unwholesome states, a monk enters and dwells in the first jhana, which is accompanied by the thought and examination with rapture and happiness born of seclusion. And then it goes on to the second and then third and the fourth jhana, each of which is spelled out a little bit here, but we've looked at those before, so I won't go through all of the details on that. The third one is good friendship. Thus I have heard among the Sakyans, Ananda approached the Blessed One, Venerable Sir, this is half of the spiritual life, that is good friendship, good companionship, and good comradeship. Not so, Ananda, not so. This is the entire spiritual life, Ananda. That is good friendship, good companionship, good comradeship. It is to be expected that he will develop and cultivate the Noble Eightfold Path. So it's important, I th think, here to catch what he's saying, because he repeats the same three things that Ananda said to him, but it is assumed that if you do that, in addition, you will actually develop and cultivate the, the Noble Eightfold Path. So he's actually referring back to that. And how, Ananda, does a monk develop and cultivate the Noble Eightfold Path? He develops right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration, and dispassion and cessation, maturing in release. By following, by the following method too, Ananda. And so he says, by relying upon me as a good friend, and so forth, goes through uh, these other li this other list again. And then the entire spiritual life is good friendship, good comradeship, um, good companionship, and good comradeship. So basically here it is the Sangha. So we all are spiritual friends among our group, and uh, however we define that group, um, because it's defined differently. There's the, the Sangha of the uh, fully ordained monks and nuns. Uh, there's a Sangha of just the actually fully enlightened beings, the monks and nuns, um, a particular uh, physical community in one place or another, uh, a group that meets together, a group that has received a particular empowerment together. I mean, there's lots of different ways that Sangha has been described, but we are all part of that Sangha, and so we all want to help each other in our own development in that process, as well as uh, being kind and so forth to beings that are not a particular member of a Sangha as a part of that. So we'll take another short break here. <laughs> 